Easter message is still proclaimed in song and in word and in our midst today. We continue um, in our sermon series, Dying to Get to Heaven. And what a beautiful way the anthem gives us that hope up yonder someday. Our scripture this morning leads us to think about that even further. So I invite you to rest your hearts and your minds in this time of prayer and let us go together into the word. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered in this place this day be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I know this may surprise some of you, being that I'm a graduate from Brian Adams High School and Texas Christian University, but there are still a lot of things that I do not know. I know, it's hard to believe. I get it. For example, I've never understood the difference between bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. Anybody want, you can tell me about that later, teach me. You know, you remember a couple years ago when they said you can't eat avocados because it has bad cholesterol. And then all of a sudden they said, oh no, it has good cholesterol. It's confusing. I don't know. And, And another thing I don't know, I don't know why my iPhones seem to work just perfectly until the warranty runs out. Then calls start dropping and my screen freezes. Anybody else have that problem? And and I don't understand how Uber is going to get flying taxis to be the thing in Dallas. Although I think it's really cool, don't you? Uh, And I don't understand why bad things happen to good people, sometimes over and over again. Some of you may have heard me say that my list of questions for the big guy upstairs, or if you've seen the shack, Big Mama, that list is getting longer and longer as the years go by. One of the things that I don't know for certain is what it's going to be like in heaven. I, I believe that I, I know that heaven is for real. The Greeks called that knowing, that sense of knowing, gnosis. Um, and it's, it's having knowledge and a wisdom that goes beyond facts and figures. I know somehow, that there is a reality after this life. But I don't have the factual proof for reference. And that's frustrating for a pastor who wants to give certain assurance to those who are traveling on the journey through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm not alone in this quest for knowledge about the eternal realm. Pete and Joe were best friends, and they shared a lifelong love for baseball, from little league to college ball. Pete was an outfielder, and Joe was a catcher. Throughout their long friendship, they shared a love for America's pastime. In their senior years, they often speculated about whether there was baseball in heaven, They agreed that whoever passed away first would find a way to contact the other one to let him know if there really was baseball in heaven. It was Joe who was called up first to the heavenly batter's box. Years passed, and Pete never heard the answer to his question. Finally, one night at bedtime, he heard a voice say, Pete, it's true. There's baseball in heaven. Joe, is it really you? Pete asked. Sure, it's me, and I want to tell you how great it is up here, Joe said. 
I've seen Sandy Koufax strike out Ty Cobb. And once I saw Babe Ruth hit a home run off Cy Young. I even got to catch Dizzy Dean in a game one time. Well, that's wonderful to hear, Joe, said Pete. Thanks for giving me the good news. Oh, I have even better news, said Joe. I saw tomorrow's lineup, and you're scheduled to play in heaven's left field. Yes, we all have our certain ideas about the heavenly realm, don't we? Including the Apostle Paul, as you heard in this morning's text. You see, the new Christians in Corinth had a lot of questions for Paul. They were asking him about everything. And and one of the things they were asking Paul was about this resurrection promise of Jesus. What's resurrection like, Paul? What's heaven like, Paul, they asked. And so in chapters 4 and 5 of his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul tries to lift up his gnosis, his knowledge about things heavenly. First, he implies that the question of eternity cannot be discussed without understanding what life in the here and now on this earthly plane is all about. He describes our earthly existence like a camp out. Let me say that again. He describes what we're doing every day as camping out. He equates our bodies with tents, temporary homes that can be moved from place to place, but which after many years of use, exposed to the elements of sun, wind, and rain, they start to break down and wear out. Not to worry, Paul admonishes. That's the way God set the whole thing up. This grand earthly adventure of life is simply a camp out. When the tent finally gives up the ghost, so to speak, we find ourselves waiting for a more permanent dwelling that's so wonderful, we can't wait to get back home. If only it were as easy as all that, right? Because Paul also reflects in this section of his letter that there are many times when we don't feel very much like happy campers at all. Paul describes our unhappiness in this way. Indeed, we groan and we long to put on our heavenly dwelling. For while we're still in this tent, we sigh with anxiety. Tents are great for camping, but they're terrible in storms. I remember one summer when I was living in Arizona, I went camping with some friends up to the the White Mountains. It was 110 in Tucson and, and 60 at the highest in the mountains, and it was wonderful to escape the heat. However, in Arizona, in the afternoons, there's always threats from monsoon rains. And sure enough, one of the evenings, the monsoon rains came with a vengeance. And even though I had pitched my tent with the metal pegs securely in the ground, when the ground gets that wet, friends, and the pegs slip out, and the wind is blowing, and, well, you can imagine, my little tent was buffeted around the campground for the duration of the storm, and it was not fun. Our bodies are so wonderful in many ways, but when the storms of life come, it's not fun. Our earthly tents can be weakened by hunger, by homelessness, by disease, by allergies, by injuries, by stress, by worry, by violence. And then if we can survive all that, by age, 
I, I, I love it that Paul uses specifically the word groan in the scriptures. Because when the weather changes as it has how many times this past week? My knees know it. Does anybody else experience that? I mean, I, I groan every time I stand up. I know, I know that there are some of you who are here today who can call me out and say that arthritis is nothing after groaning, after rounds of chemo, right? Or after major heart surgery, or after the brokenness of a heart when we've lost the love of our life. Talk about groaning. Back in chapter 4, Paul, in the section right before the text we heard read today, he writes in verse 16, don't lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed every day for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. An eternal weight of glory is waiting for us. And I know that to be true. That what is waiting for us in the by and by is so glorious that part of me really can't wait to get there. But still, I'm here. We're all here in this realm. And even though I get when Paul describes our earthly groanings as only momentary afflictions, when we're in the midst of the storm, when we're in the midst of the struggle, I don't find it comforting to have someone come up to me and pat me on the knee and say, it's only momentary afflictions, dear. Momentary afflictions are still afflictions. Life is difficult in those moments. And they are accompanied by groans of pain. In those moments, it really is hard to find the fun in this camp out of a life. Paul thinks, and I agree with him, that there's a purpose to this pain we all encounter. Even if we don't like it, and even if we do everything we can to avoid it. And oh my, don't we do our best to avoid pain. We, we look for escape by taking those prescription or unauthorized drugs. We try to escape by immersing ourselves now in those virtual reality goggles taking us to another world or even in our love of sports like watching the Rangers or perhaps the NFL draft for three nights straight. There are some of us who even believe that by claiming faith in Jesus Christ, and being baptized, that, that we are coated like with Teflon. And that just by virtue of our baptism, that we will be protected from life's hardships. Boy, that's where a lot of believers get it off, get it wrong. Paul acknowledged that even, uh, and even insisted, that it's Im important for us to experience pain, that it's part of the plan. God came to earth in human form to let us know that he understands our struggle. He's been there, done that. That like a mother's child, for, uh, love for her child, our creator has this empathetic knowledge about what her children are going through. Paul reminds us that we're never alone in the storm. Dr. Eugene Peterson, in his transliteration of the Bible, and especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, says it one of the best ways I've ever heard. When Paul writes, we carry this message around in unadorned pots of clay, our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone 
from confusing God's incomparable power with ours. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not that much to look at. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles. But we're never demoralized. We're not sure always what to do. But we know God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God never left our side. We've been thrown down, but we've never been broken. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Trials, tortures, mockery, murder. What Jesus did among them, he does in us. He lives. Our lives are at constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, we're getting in on the best. These words from Paul have been what have comforted me, comforted me when I've gone through my earthly struggles in this tent-like dwelling the skin that is my earthly home. Pain is real. But there is meaning in pain. I can withstand the pain because I know that someday, some way, it will end. And that there is something waiting for me beyond the tears, beyond the heartache, Beyond the mourning and the loss, the old order will pass away, as John said in his revelation. And if things were perfect in the here and now, in this camp out of a life, then would we ever want to leave it, to let it go? There's a purpose for our pain, for our struggle. It helps us when it's our turn to be called up to the batter's box in heaven. To let go of this life and grab hold of the rest. We know this because we walk by faith and not by sight. We know that one day we'll be at home with the Lord. Until then, we can endure afflictions and groan as loud as we want to because we know that we are not alone. And this too shall pass. The old country western singer, Tennessee Ernie Ford, sang it best, well, not best, I think our choir sang it best, second best, when he sang this, ain't gonna need this house no longer, ain't gonna need this house no more, ain't got time to fix the shingles, ain't got time to fix the door, ain't got time to oil the hinges, nor to mend the window pane, ain't gonna need this house no longer, I'm getting ready to meet the saint. So the next time you're a moaning and a groaning and are feeling afflicted on every side, listen for that still, small voice to say, yep, it's a good Friday day. But Easter Sunday's coming and you'll be going home one day. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, the journeys that each one of us take are so different. Our own unique challenges and joys, struggles and storms. And yet what binds us all together is that we journey together. 
with you as our leader, our Lord, our Savior, leading us through it all until that day when we will truly be one with you again. Thanks be to the gift of that hope, that knowledge, that certainty that home awaits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we celebrate the gift of life and life eternal, those days when it does feel like fun camp out, and those days that feel like our tent is a little torn and battered by the storms of life, all of those days. If there are those of you who are here today who are looking for a community in which to journey and to share in vision and hope in that home beyond, if you're looking for a church home in the here and now that helps remind each other that there's good things yet to come, please be welcome to join with us as we all stand to sing that great hymn of faith, Blessed Assurance, it's ours, we have it. Let us stand and sing of that. Mm -hmm.